Okay, Al Ghazali part two, the alchemy of happiness. Okay, today we're going to do something unusual. We're going to talk about suffering. <laughs> now, this is a class on happiness, so what does, right? And it's not going to be about overcoming suffering either, like we've been talking so far. We're going to have a very unusual take on suffering uh, with this particular author, right? So let's go to first, let me go over. Yes. So. Let's remind ourselves in general, right, uh, Sufism as well as um, Al-Ghazali, Rumi uh, is part of this idea, right? This is the whole idea that our true selves, right, the true destiny of the self is not to be found in the material world. I think by now <laughs> we've figured that out with all the texts that we've been doing, right, that there is two, we are, we are dual citizens, right? Part of us is in the material realm, but there's also a part of us in the spiritual realm, right? We saw this with the Tao Te Ching, with the Upanishads, with uh, Al-Ghazali, obviously. Uh, Ecclesiastes, not so much. He's very much more down to earth, but who else have we studied? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Gospel of John also pretty existential, pretty in the world, right? We saw it's about love and, right, it's about... Uh, if, you, if you remember having an open mind and also about pouring yourself and receive so it's a little different but in general right with um, a lot of philosophies um, whether it's Hindu or Greek or at this point uh, Muslim philosophy there's this notion that we are dual citizens there are two dimensions right we didn't see that in John or Ecclesiastes why because in the Hebraic worldview there's only one dimension right there is no dualism in the Hebraic worldview so in, in the Gospel of John, which is still very much Hebrew thinking, and Ecclesiastes, we only saw in the here and now, right? But in other texts, which are dualistic, meaning there are two worlds, right? The Upanishads is one of them. Uh, not so much the Tao Te Ching. Tao Te Ching is about now, nature, right? But Upanishads and then Greek thought, and then, of course, Al-Ghazali, we are citizens of two worlds. And the key is to rise above the material and connect to the spiritual. That's the key. Right? So I hope you notice the difference between the, the more down-to-earth philosophers we've done, such as the Tao Te Ching, Ecclesiastes, Book of John, is all about connecting to the, within the world. You're not going anywhere else. <laughs> right? Here and now, how do I navigate? Right? These other guys, Upanishads and uh, um, Plato that we talked about briefly, and then Al-Ghazali, who is influenced by Plato, um, you have this notion that we have to rise above the material right, and connect to this higher dimension which is a spiritual realm right so um so we saw the cave right uh, so in plato's cave uh, the 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 person who frees themselves right they they go towards the light or towards the spiritual realm with their own uh, initiative right they naturally they, they're curious it's the philosopher right it's plato they're curious. They're themselves wanting to explore more and to find that higher destiny. Now, Al-Ghazali is a little more realistic. He knows that most of us don't have that curiosity. We just settled in the cave very comfortably, right? We are happy with our world of shadows. We have a unique goal is to graduate, get a job, get married, and have money, right? Correct? <laughs> That's most of us, right? So Al-Ghazali is aware that unless we are pushed out of the cave we're not going to leave the cave and guess what is used to push us out of the cave suffering right rumi in a similar poem remember rumi is a same branch of islam right both are sufis rumi says in one of his poems that um, god is like a doctor who has to give us bitter medicine in order to heal us from our attachment to the material realm right so in one of his poems called and you can look it up online called the ladder to heaven um, he talks about, and I think you're doing it, Castro. Right? <laughs> uh, sorry, Ramos. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so yeah, Ramos, you're doing it in class right now, right? The ladder to heaven. He's talking about God as, as a doctor, who has to give us. See, nowadays medicine is all sweet, you know, and disgusting, like Nyquil, right? It's all like purple and sugary. Back in the day, if you remember your grandmother's remedies, right? Let, let's, let's just stop and do that for a second. What did your grandmother give you when you had a cold? What were some of the ways she tortured you when you got sick? Hot soup. Oh, hot, that's a good thing. You have a nice grandmother. Hot soup is good. I'm talking about the but, bitter. Oh, yes. I have another one then. So in, uh, in Hispanic countries, I don't know. I've never seen this, but my grandmother used to do it when I was little. 
And if you got really sick, she used to grab a rag and she used to dip it in something. I used to think it used to smell like onions or something else. And she used to dip it in that and everything. And this rag, you just have a bunch of other stuff. And we used to, and then she used to take the rag and she put it on my forehead and it smelled horrible. Okay, good. Horrible. There we go. That's a, that's the next, uh, day. Yeah, next day I wake up and I'm fine. I'm like, this is some boohoo. Wow, I'm intrigued. Okay, that's a good example. Anybody else have a whole, yes? Yeah, my grandma, I guess my mother also um, has like the same thing as well. But um, she would have like eucalyptus leaves and then like, like, like really hot water. And then like, I guess if you have like chest problems, you would breathe, breathe it, right? It yeah. Yes. I'm not yes. sure what it's called. Exactly. It's an inhalation, right? Inhalation? I called it, I had that too. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Anybody else have a bitter? Bitter remedy. Here, here's a good one when you have a sore throat and everything, or a fever, or like a cold. Hot peppers, uh, jalapeno. Uh, you fry them, and you put a little salt, and then you have bread, and then a big glass of milk, right, for the tongue, which is gonna like catch on fire, and you just eat them, and they will burn everything, and all your disease. The next day, you're fine. <laughs> so here's another one, right? Or garlic. Anybody have garlic stuff? <laughs> okay. So there's a number, right? So. This is what uh, Rumi, which Anal Ghazali is going to say the same thing, Rumi says something similar, right? God comes, gives us bitter remedy, it tastes horrible, but it heals us, right? Of our attachment to the material, it, it makes us healthy spiritually because it, it, it creates the ability to connect to the spiritual. Right? So Al Ghazali says something exactly similar here in this text, in case you didn't notice, right? This is the same thing, right? Suffering is a gift from God. So this is a very different take on happiness than what we've done so far, right? So far, we've been trying to cultivate a happy, joyful, right, um, approach to life and what do we need to shift in our mind and how, what do we need to, what position do we need, what, what repositioning do we need to do? Here, Rumi is saying straight up, happiness is not the path, right? Suffering is the path to your higher self. Happiness is only going to come once you've gone through the wilderness of suffering or true happiness, right? So there's the false happiness where you're comfortable in the material realm and everything's going well. And there, Rumi is saying, yeah, you're happy, but you're like what we French say, you're an imbecile heureux, right? A happy imbecile, <laughs> right? Happy idiot. Um, but once you've suffered, right, and you've achieved a higher level of yourself, once you've purified yourself through the suffering and you encounter joy, it's completely different, right? You are capable of, of a much higher joy. You're capable of um, a much higher experience of life, right? So much more intense, right? Yes. Remind me. Did Upanishad say that? It said he had to die, right? So maybe in that sense, right? That. I I think for sure though. In order to reach, like if we're higher than the angels are, you were saying that also. If we're higher than the angels, we went through suffering. Oh, so that's the Ecclesiastes probably. That's Hebrew. That's in the Talmud, right? This idea that we're higher than the angels because we went through suffering and they didn't. So yes. So. It's similar, right? Maybe, yes, there is a connection. You're giving me ideas for test questions. <laughs> so, yes, very good. Right, so absolutely. Right, this is the idea that actually the highest goal is not to be happy, but to learn to navigate suffering and to learn to suffer gracefully because that, so the highest goal is purification and not happiness. I think that's how he would put it, right? So, the, so there's actually a higher goal than happiness. And by the way, Kant is going to say something similar, right? Ramos, you're doing Kant also. So you can basically skip a, <laughs> the whole next class because we're going to do exactly the same thing, <laughs> right? So and we'll see again, right? With Kant also, higher destiny than happiness, right? There is a higher self. So here we're getting a taste of it already with Al-Ghazali. He's saying, no, feeling peaceful and happy and joyful is not the highest state you should achieve. It's purification that is the highest state. And we're going to talk about that now right how 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 suffering purifies us and heals us from our coarse material selves right okay so let's go to the text i'm going to start with um page 27 so there's two parts here in his um 
writing on suffering, right? First, he's going to talk about those who escape suffering. So remember, for him, suffering is a gift from God to purify us. So he, but he's going to say most of us, right, when suffering comes, we try to escape it, right? And he's going to talk about three different, uh, and I mean, we have created whole professions around the escape of suffering. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying the whole profession of medicine is created to uh, kind of uh, protect us from suffering. Then he's going to talk about uh, uh, physics. We'll see what that means. And then astrology is another profession. right? And we could add now we have more, right? We have uh, therapy, counseling, psychology. What else do we have? Um, the whole drug industry, <laughs> right? Both psychological and physical drugs, right? In order to avoid suffering. Uh, the whole entertainment industry <laughs> for us, right? Is a way to, right? You go home, you're miserable, you turn on Netflix, you, you're good, you don't have to think. I had a season I was watching. Did you see this, this show, Homeland? It's in the 90s. Nobody saw that? Oh my God, Homeland. Oh, I saw part of it. Right? Part of it. I saw the whole, I was miserable at that time. I saw the whole thing. <laughs> so I was watching hours, like at least five hours a day. Um, so yeah, Netflix is great when you're going through stuff. <laughs> so, so we have, right, in addition to these three that he's going to talk about, we have massive investment in our society in a disciplines or um, uh what do you call it, professions, right, which are there to keep us from suffering. And, and so uh, uh, Al-Ghazali, of course, is going to say we need to, right, we need to choose another path. So let's go and see what he says about the doctor, the physicist, the astrologer. Page 27, uh, first paragraph, the big one. So he says, right, this is how we as a human uh, human civilization have worked hard to avoid suffering. He says, for instance, third line, are you there? For instance, if a man, everybody with me, wave at me somebody who's there. For instance, nobody's there. <laughs> Page 27, second paragraph, third line, for instance. I need is one. Your, is your translation based on chapter? Do you have chapters? Um, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> Uh, chapter two. Yeah. Now is anyone with me? <laughs> For instance, yes. Okay. All right. Who else is oh, with me? Hi. Okay, good. Two people. That's enough. The rest of you, <laughs> suck it up. Okay. For instance, if a man ceases to take any interest in worldly matters, conceives a distaste for common pleasures, and appears sunk in depression, we see this as abnormal. Right? And the doctor immediately will say, this is a case of melancholy and requires such and such. So here a doctor is more like our psychologist, right? Such and such a prescription. The physicist sounds more like today's doctor. This is a dryness of the brain caused by hot weather and cannot be relieved till the air becomes moist. So these are the physiological reasons for your depression. And then the astrologer, today we could say like the the priest or the pastor or the imam, right, will say, ah, this is some particular conjunction or position of the planets, right? So you have the emotional, physical, spiritual uh, tools to avoid suffering. And by the way, all the texts we have read are tools to avoid or at least to navigate suffering. Here he's saying, no, don't. Don't try to avoid it, right? So he says this, right? Thus far their wisdom reaches, says the Quran. And then he says this. It does not occur to them that what has really happened is this, that the Almighty has a concern for the welfare of that man and therefore has commanded his servants, the planets or the elements, to produce such a condition in him that he may turn away from the world to his maker. That's the goal of suffering. In the moments of deepest suffering, there is a crack in your system something opens up in you and there's an opportunity which you can choose to take or not to connect to the spiritual realm, right? Suffering opens us up. Suffering cracks us open, right? And at that moment, we choose, of course, but we have the opportunity to connect to something deeper. It gives us an incentive. If everything is going well, why would you turn to anything else, right? And so that's what he's saying. It turns us to our makers, right? Um, and we'll talk later about uh, possible examples of this, right? That's the idea here. It, it cracks open our self-enclosed system. It, it cracks open the cave where we are comfortable to a, deeper, to a deeper experience of our humanity, to connecting to a deeper level of being, right? That is what Rumi calls the, the spiritual realm, right? So then he continues... Um, 
The knowledge of this fact is a lustrous pearl from the ocean of inspirational knowledge to which all other forms of knowledge are as islands in the sea. And then he continues, the doctor, the physicist, and astrologer are doubtless right, each in his particular branch of knowledge, but they do not see that illness is, so to speak, a cord of love by which God draws to himself the saints concerning whom he has said, I have sick and ye visited me not. Right, so this is really God calling us. When we are in pain, there is within that pain a calling, right? And then he continues, illness itself is one of those forms of experience by which man arrives at the knowledge of God. As he says by the word of the prophet, sicknesses themselves are my servants and are attached to my children. It's a beautiful, beautiful text, right? Very poetic. So that's the main idea here, right? That the suffering is brought in our lives to crack us open to a deeper reality, a deeper uh, dimension of being. And of course, it's up to us to go that path, right? To take that orientation or not, right? Um, so let's, let's look a little bit practically, right? What does this look like? Have anyone, has anyone suffered and found that there was a deeper experience that this suffering produced in you? Let's share a little bit and see, let's be a little more concrete. Um, uh, go ahead, uh, whoever you are. <laughs> Ramos. <laughs> When I was like 16, 15, 16, 15, when I was 15 or 16, I was like in soccer, got scouted for it, I played for it, I was in multiple teams at once, like I was making a career out of soccer at such a like young age, and there was an injury that happened that had to do with like brain issues and stuff like that that made me sort of leave soccer and everything that I was doing, and I was heartbroken, I was sort of like, how am I going to sort of be successful in the same way, even though I was 15 and I was unsuccessful. But how am I going to be like this type of person again if I don't have what it took to make me that way anymore? Um, and then it just sort of took me finding something else and something and finding something within myself to say that I don't need anything else besides myself. Okay, this is very, very Al-Ghazalian because he talks about ex essence and accidents. Mm -hmm. And actually, it connected you to your true self, right? The suffering took away all the accidental version of yourself, like I'm a soccer player, I'm a sports person, I'm an athlete, and these were all accidental, and the suffering just wiped those away so that you had to look, who am I really? And it connected you to your true self. So that's a very good example, and it's, it's what he says. He does say at one point, it pulls us away from the accidental and pushes us to see the essential self. So, right? so suffering will do that. It will take away all your false selves, all your personas, all these things you project, right? When you project beauty or you project strength or you project confidence or you project, right? Gone! <laughs> What's left? Now you have to find, right? When everything is taken from you, you have to realize where, who am I, right? What is left? And at that moment, you connect to your true self, right? To your essential self, which you couldn't see or connect to before. And now you re-enter the world, doesn't mean you'll never play soccer again or whatnot, but you re-enter a different person. You have, you have true confidence, you have true beauty, you have true power, right? It's no more these projections, these fake selves that you're projecting to look a certain way. You are now, right? You've connected to it. So it's a very powerful experience, right? Suffering can do that. Anybody else? That was a great example. I'm going to go around everybody because we have some time. <laughs> I'm just going to force you to talk. Ojuma. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind. Not yet. It will come. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Azarad. Um, I did similar to you. Uh, I played baseball my whole life. And also when I was like 15 or 16, I was, I was a pitcher. And I tore something in my arm. So now every time I throw, I feel it in my shoulder. And so now it's hard for me to play. But again, it taught me that. Like I was also very good at baseball. Like all the coaches were like, "Oh, you're gonna, you're gonna be great," and then this happened. Mm -hmm. And so now it taught, and I was like excited to go to college to play baseball and all that stuff. But now I'm able to play golf baseball as well. But so where is the treasure that you dug yeah, up from that now, suffering? Tell us. <laughs> I like baseball was my whole life. Every time I played baseball, but then 
then once that happened, I realized that I can't do baseball anymore because I found happiness in other things. So, I don't know. I mean, I guess like school in a way also, and being more social other than baseball. Okay, very good. Most of my time was spent playing baseball, but when I decided to go out, make new friends, and I realized that I don't need baseball to be happy and to find my own. Okay, excellent, right? You discovered a deeper, other facets of yourself, which were never going to be explored, right? If you had that, right? So you actually, again, it's a, it's a question of connecting to one's hidden true self, right? So I like that a lot. Very good. Uh, you guys are helping me, actually. I'm thinking of one thing right now, and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's how I could see this. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, Castro, this um, time yeah, I got it right. I'm having a hard time thinking of one, but I think something close to that would be in high school. Sorry, <clears throat> this is cough. Um, in high school, right, they had us take shop classes for four years. So I chose computer science since I was in freshman year. And once I, and once I was in my s senior year, they had us pick like, which colleges we wanted to go to. So I picked here, but uh, you know, I guess I was still rather young, so I was like had a lot of anxiety and a lot of worries too. I guess you could contribute that to suffering. So um, I wasn't sure because I didn't enjoy doing it. You know, it's not something I want to pursue more here. Um, and then I was having a really hard time until I realized I really enjoyed history and being in front of like the classroom and talking too. Uh, so that's when you know uh, I kind of started to calm down a bit. Like I really thought about myself and what I would do. So I guess that kind of relates to this as well. Like I didn't really suffer as much. I didn't get hurt or anything. But uh, yeah, I guess doing four years of that like really um, showed me that I really didn't enjoy doing this. So I looked like through a different method, a different path, and then I'm doing history here. So okay, good. So that. yeah, sometimes when you're on the wrong path, the suffering pushes you to the right path, right? Yeah, so sure. yes, that's that's very good. So here you're seeing suffering less as a remedy, but kind of like a force orienting you right on on your path. I like that, Lanera. Um, I guess. Since I, ever, since I could ever remember, I've had like depression and anxiety. I think I mentioned this before, but like the first time I've ever had anxiety was after 9-11. I remember we went on a plane, I kept asking like my parents to do this, this, this kind of crash or whatever. And still to this day, I get like, especially around September 11th, I get this, because I have family that died in 9-11. So like, I get this idea like, like when I'm sitting in my room, I think sometimes like what, what happens if a plane just like randomly like, crashes and happens or whatever. But I mean, I've always struggled with depression ever since I was in like the fifth grade. Um, I'm not, to this day, I'm still not sure if whether it's like nature or hereditary or it's part of the environment. My dad lost his job in the way, you know, we knew what happened to mine. Um, but I think over the years, as a kid, you don't realize how dependent you are on other people. And when you have other people like ignoring, you know, depression or whatever, it's definitely hard. Um, but I realized that now, once like I got older, like 18, 19, 20, I realized that self-loathing isn't really an option because I would I would always like binge eat and like spend all my time like talking to my friends on on, our, on, our, on my computer. Like we play a lot of games or whatever. But I realized that no one is gonna change myself for me, so I started to take my life in my own hands. I mean, I've always worked ever since I was 17, but like working, going to school, has definitely kept me on like a, a straight path. And whether or not like you know. I, I might I might combat that like material wealth won't give you happiness because I think that material wealth is as a necessity especially like nowadays you know would you rather be homeless like you, there's some people that don't have the luxury of having you know that money to fall back on but definitely like hard like going through stuff like that that was hard I learned how to become like a stronger person okay good there you go right you connected to your yeah. the strength that was that you didn't know was there right yeah. so that's that's also very good. I like that. Excellent. Good <laughs> Um, Yeah, so I guess uh, I feel like it's really easy in retrospect to look at kind of the worst things that happened to you in your life and kind of see that like from there you actually grew the most. So like what seemed at the time to be like you know, the end of your world. You yes. Know, whatever <laughs> felt like really terrible at the time was actually what kind of pushed you mm. into making like the biggest changes. Excellent. Yeah, I guess I'd say that that's Very good. good. Yeah, it seems like you've come to the end of your world. I love the way you put it. I've had that too. And then looking back, you're like, oh, well, that was just me bringing birth into a new dimension, right? That's more like the Upanishads, but very good. Uh, Bukhari, Dib, anything you want to add to the discussion? <laughs> 
What was the um, question? Oh. <laughs> uh, the question is, um, have you been through some suffering which in the end you, you came out better person? Uh, so Div, go ahead, and then Bokari. All right, so I've I've gone through something like that pretty major. I've heard a lot of people with the sports. So I used to be a, a avid swimmer and I used to love swimming, but then in when I was sixteen, I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease that if, uh, that hit me in my lower spine and my knee, and of course for swimming those are the two most important things. So it was really it was really impactful for me because. My entire life, I was like, I wanted to be an Olympic swimmer. Like, that was my goal since I was, like, 12. I had a whole chart. I had pictures of the best swimmers on my wall. So, it really, like, it really broke me really bad. And for, like, years, and I think even till now, I'm, like, I still haven't, like, coped with it in a sense. Because, like, oh, thanks. Oh, sorry. I was swimming. And I don't know. I. I Honestly, I can't say that I actually like coped with the suffering. I've accepted it and I've thrown myself into like philosophy because I'm not big on God. So I wasn't like, this is part of his plan. I just think that things happen because they happen. So I just threw myself into that and just like coping with it. And like the Stoics is when I, I relate to the most. Yes. So I like, so with Stoicism, I just like full on threw myself into that. And it really helped me a lot. Really good, but yeah. to say that, to say that I, I found like a deeper meaning or as you said, like, uh, I wouldn't say either I escaped the suffering, but I find like a deeper connection or a deeper, or the maker, I wouldn't think I've gotten to that point, no. That's Great. why I'm in philosophy, just to get to that point. Yes, that's an excellent, I love it, um, because you're still in it, right? So you, you, you don't yet are able to see, right? And, but, but I love the way you're coping with it through the Stoics, right? Which sadly, we're not going to study <laughs> anymore. So just read it, guys, you don't need me. You can just read this stuff. Um, um, that's one of the reasons I'm not going to teach it, because I was reading and I'm like, what, what? Why am I here? They can just read this, right? So if you bought the book, right, by Epictetus, read it because this is really um, one of the best ways to um, really navigate suffering. I also took it out of the program because it resonated a lot with the Tao Te Ching that we already did. So there was a lot too much in common. I was like, oh, it's repetitive. Um, so, but yeah, absolutely. I really suggest, oh my goodness, I got my pencil caught in my hair. Um, I really suggest, right, try to read Epictetus on your own because it, uh, uh, Div is right. This is really one way to very dignified, to navigate suffering in a very graceful and dignified way. Uh, excellent. Bokari, you end. Anything you want to share? Um, can you just repeat the question again? Yes. So have you been through any suffering and have you learned anything from it? Um, I guess suffering, like last year, I dealt with the loss of my cats and then earlier this year which was like heartbreaking heartbreaking actually and then like it takes time for people to heal and grieve so it took me time to grieve and like you know accept that he's no longer with us and that but he's still with us like my heart you know and did the did this um suffering do you feel like it connected you to anything within yourself do you feel like something do you feel like you grew from it somehow do you think that anything good come came out of it for you i feel like i grew from it because like i didn't want to spend time like grieving too much because then i would be feeling upset okay good. i think it made me stronger very good right you learn to grieve in a healthy way right absolutely very good okay good so conclusions right thank you all for sharing <laughs> that was good Right. Conclusion. What we realize is that um, our pain, the pain we go through, right, when we're not happy. I know throughout the whole semester we're teaching us how to position ourselves to, right, happiness is a virtue. You can make it happen and so forth. But sometimes we are just overwhelmed by the pain and there's no amount of meditation or <laughs> whatever that's going to take away the pain or the hole in your heart, right? So at that moment, so, uh, Al-Ghazali is suggesting embrace it. Receive it as medicine let it really do its transformative work within yourself right so you can still do the practices like you know qigong and yoga that we did and the meditation and trying to shift your perspective like um right or trying to do acts of loving kindness like we have in the gospels there you can still do all these practices but your heart will not go is not going to be jumping with joy through these practices the heart will still feel like there's a hole in it what al-ghazali is saying when it comes to the heart just let it be cleansed 
let it stay there don't try to you know uh, don't try to avoid it don't try to ignore it don't repress it just embrace it and let the suffering flow over your heart and reshape it into something else that's what we f we should be feeling when we're suffering by all means do all the other practices we talked about but let your heart go through its transformation this is ultimately the meaning of the title the alchemy of happiness right there is an alchemy taking place in your heart where suffering is the fire that consumes the heart and allows it to go into the next level right remember we talked about alchemy there's always an alchemy there's a crucible there's a fire and inside the crucible there is a shift from different um, from one state to the other so the fire is the suffering right the crucible is we could say your body and the, the 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 stuff inside is your heart right so the fire is causing actually these alchemical transformations uh, and so we have to in a way just allow it to happen we should do the other practices so we don't sink into despair or negativity right it's still important to cleanse the heart of negativity it's important to meditate to do these practices to do acts of love to keep an open mind to reinterpret the suffering as maybe like solomon right all seasons are good right so you can do all this mind work body work but when it comes to the depths of your heart just allow the fire to consume it and allow your heart to be transmuted into uh or enlarged by the suffering or right transformed into a um allow yourself to be transformed right into a higher version of yourself so that's the idea here. The suffering is that which burns the soul and purifies it, right? And gets rid of the impurities. That which you cannot get rid of with just the mind, right? And the act of forgiveness. The suffering will take care of that, the rest, whatever is left, right? Um, okay, good. So that brings us to the end of our time with Al-Ghazali. Is there a test? Yes, right? Tuesday, okay. I didn't give you the questions, right? So I will put on Blackboard. I'll do it now. I'll think about it now. You won't come to class on Tuesday, correct? No class on Tuesday. This is time for you to uh, do your test. <laughs> right. And then, and then you will bring the test on uh, Thursday. And on Thursday, I will introduce Kant. And then next week, you'll start doing the reading assignments and so forth. So that's the program. Um, so is there a reading assignment for Thursday, too? No. Nope. No, 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 because I introduced Kant, right? So what I'm going to do is, um, when am I going to do this? Let me, I need to revamp the syllabus so we know that. <laughs> do you guys want me to, from now on, just put in the announcements what's for the next time, or you can just read the syllabus? Oh, for next time. Yeah, for next time I'll do that. Okay, good. So the syllabus I need to revamp. I need to find the pages for each. No, since we're all going to work with uh, gay science now, right? So I, I, we can keep it as it is. But I need to revamp the syllabus. Okay. And then what, was I, what did I say I was going to do? Let me stop this recording. <laughs>